Hello, everyone. I'm Alonzo Martinez, Associate General Counsel at HireRight, and this is Fall into Compliance, the third webinar in our 2023 Navigating Compliance Quarterly Compliance Series. While I am a lawyer, today's webinar is not intended as legal or compliance advice. My intentions are to give you information that you'll take as talking points to raise with your teams and your legal counsel. Before we begin, as always, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. During this webinar, please take the conversation to Twitter, or X as we're calling it now, using the hashtag HireRightWebinar. In order to receive HRCI or SHRM credit, you must attend the full live session of this webinar. Credit information will be emailed a few days after the webinar. We're not providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email with a link to a recording of this webinar session. If you are experiencing any audio or video issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard or send us a message using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Sharon is producing today's webinar and will be monitoring the feed for any technical issues. After the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback. Please take our brief survey and let us know if this session was helpful. My focus is to create sessions that are meaningful, so we welcome ideas for future topics. So again, please take 60 seconds out of your day and let us know what you think. And again, press F5 on your keyboard to refresh this presentation anytime you experience any audio or video problems. Well, we've put one legislative session behind us and are already preparing for next year. For me, the 2023 legislative session has been a departure from years past. You've heard me talk about this uh, throughout the year. We've seen this trend away from very narrow legislation to broad measures that have a greater impact and support of workers' rights at the expense of additional compliance obligations for employers. And that is exactly what we're gonna cover today. As I mentioned, we're seeing this trend towards clean slate laws that seal or expunge criminal records, replacing bound the box measures, although we'll cover one bound the box update for today. Pay transparency, this is sharing salaries, replacing general pay equity laws, and more legalization in the marijuana space. And there have been significant updates to the I-9 process that you should be made aware of. So, so that's the rundown on the screen. I'm gonna provide an overview of the current state of the law and a snapshot of legislation that we're monitoring. And most importantly, I'll offer some practical guidance to comply or to prepare to comply with those laws or regulations. As always, we have a lot of ground to cover today. I'm gonna to try and keep a quick pace through these topics. So please do not consider this to be a comprehensive discussion, but it should provide you with a good overview. And I'm always looking for new opportunities to create content that's beneficial for you. So when you fill out the survey, let me know what you'd like me to focus on in future webinars. We can do more than just these quarterly compliance webinars. So settle in for the next hour. Remember, if you have any questions during this webinar, use that Q&A icon and I'll try and cover those at the end. We're gonna kick things off today with a broad discussion concerning criminal history reform. And here is a look at clean slate laws across the United States. As I mentioned in the rundown, clean slate laws expunge or seal certain criminal records from public access once somebody remains crime-free for a period of time. And as you can see on the screen, every state except for Wisconsin offers some form of post-conviction expungement or sealing of qualifying criminal offenses to varying degrees. In case you're wondering if you're over the age of 25 and were convicted of a crime in Wisconsin, you'll have to petition the governor for a pardon for post-conviction relief but that conviction still stays on the record. You get a pardon, but the conviction's still there. And in the rest of the United States, you'll see varying degrees of criminal history relief available. The states in red offer the broadest levels of relief. Most nonviolent felony and misdemeanor convictions can be wiped clean, while those in that orange or terracotta color are the most restrictive. They only permit sealing or expunging of specific offenses as directed by that state's statute. So again, the takeaway is that in most states, there's some form of post-conviction relief that wipes a nonviolent criminal record clean so that qualifying offenses no longer appear in a court's record. And as a result, they're not gonna be reported on a criminal background check. And I've created this map to show you the states that offer automatic relief to ex-offenders. This means that qualifying offenses are automatically expunged or sealed from a court's records. And you can see the different types of offenses available for automatic relief in the legend to this map, with those states in red offering the broadest types of crimes available for autom automatic relief, generally all nonviolent convictions and non-convictions, 
and those in that terracotta or orange color being the most restrictive, generally non-convictions only. And in the gray states, an individual needs to petition the court to have any qualifying criminal history sealed or expunged. It's not automatic in those gray states, it requires some action on part of the individual. Now here's an overview of clean slate laws that were passed or became effective in the third quarter, starting with California. California leads the country in criminal history reform by extending automatic relief to felony level offenses after only four years. This is a really short period of time comparatively. In California, automatic expungement becomes available for most defendants convicted of most nonviolent felonies. And even those convicted of violent or other serious felony offenses, they can petition a court for expungement. California is by far the most generous clean slate law for ex-offenders. And California's law became effective on July the 1st. Moving to New York, New York expanded its clean slate law. The existing clean slate law in New York permits cr criminal records to be sealed through a judicial review process. This new legislation, that's Assembly Bill 1029C, it automatically seals eligible cases, so there's no need to apply for expungement. Misdemeanor offenses are automatically sealed three years after the term of the sentence, and eligible felony convictions are sealed eight years after the duration of the sentence. Class A felonies and convictions requiring registration as a sex offender are ineligible for automatic sealing. Again, once sealed, the records are unavailable to most employers. The bill has not been delivered to Governor Hochul. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick civics lesson. The governor has 10 days, not considering Sundays, so 10 days Monday through Saturday to sign or veto a bill before it automatically becomes law once lawmakers deliver it to the governor's desk. So while lawmakers could deliver the bill to the governor at any time, they'll typically wait until the governor asks them for them to send the legislation to ensure the governor has had an opportunity to review it or negotiate amendments to the bill before it's signed. And this bill is a little controversial. Hochul is in favor of, of clean slates and fair chance, but not necessarily this language. So if the bill is signed, it'll become effective one year later. Again, I'll of course provide you with an update if and when it becomes law, probably gonna become law, but we'll have to wait and see. As I mentioned at the top of the call, while there's been a lot of movement with sealing and expunging criminal history through clean slate laws, there have been very few developments in the band the box arena. But I do have one major update for you, which we're gonna cover shortly. But first, here is a look at the landscape of band the box jurisdictions impacting private employers at the state and local levels. In all 39 jurisdictions that you see on the screen, you can't ask me, have you ever been convicted of a crime question until some later time in the hiring process? In the 19 jurisdictions that you see on the screen in red text, the ban the box measure applies to any form of work for monetary gain. So if you pay somebody to do a job, then they're subject to the ban the box measure. So this would include not only your traditional employees, but also contractors. Not all ban the box laws are created equal. That's one of my favorite phrases. In all ban the box jurisdictions, you generally can't ask the candidate if they've ever been convicted of a crime during the initial application or request a criminal background check before a conditional offer. Those that are in the standard gray box fit that category. But then there are also some jurisdictions that require special handling. On the screen, you're gonna see those in that aqua column that require that you identify the criminal conduct that may disqualify a candidate from hire and provide them with a notice as part of the pre-adverse action process. Then there are those in that blue column that require that you conduct and provide an individualized assessment that relates the candidate's criminal conduct to their job as part of the pre-adverse action process. And in Los Angeles and New York City, shown in that wine colored column on your screen, you also need to provide city provided notices or substantially similar forms as part of the pre-adverse action process. Then to complicate matters a little further, there are four jurisdictions, Louisiana, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, and Gainesville, Florida, that don't specifically ban the box, but do require that you conduct an individualized assessment. Again, an individualized assessment is your analysis of the candidate's criminal history and its potential relationship to the position for which they are under consideration. While you have to perform that analysis, you don't necessarily need to provide it to the candidate. I always relate back to the EEOC's 2012 guidance to employers concerning the use of arrest and conviction records. It is a really good read that can help you understand the individualized assessment process if you're unfamiliar with it. 
Uh, for what it's worth, I've linked to it in the resources section of this webinar. It is an incredibly helpful piece of guidance, so take a look at it. And as you've probably gathered, you can't adopt a one-size-fits-all model for compliance. You're going to have to modify your adjudication and pre-adverse and adverse action practices to align with a particular jurisdiction's law. So with that said, just a quick reminder that you can use HireRight's compliance workbench solution to help manage your band the box obligations. The solution is made available for free. So let us know if you want more information when you fill out the survey. So let's talk about what is going on in California. If you are a HireRight customer, you should have received a few updates concerning California's amended Fair Chance Act, which I've summarized on the screen. Let's run through some of the updates. First, the definition of an employer has been greatly expanded. The term employer includes not only direct employers, but also entities acting as agents or evaluating an applicant's criminal history on behalf of an employer. So staffing agencies, other entities obtaining workers from a pool or availability list, they're all included in this definition of an employer. So this means that any entity that grades or makes an employment decision based on an individual's criminal history is on the hook to comply with the revised Fair Chance Act. The revised regulations add two categories of employees in its definition of an applicant. First, existing employees who have applied for or who have indicated a specific desire to be considered for a different position within their current employer. And second, existing employees who are subject to review and consideration of criminal history because of a change in the company's ownership, their management policy or practices. So let's key into some of the key changes and implications for employers. The revised Fair Chance Act regulation clarifies that with limited exceptions, employers have no legal obligation to check the criminal histories of job applicants or current employees. Only employers required by law to conduct criminal background checks can do so before making a conditional offer of employment. All other employers can still conduct criminal checks, but only after conducting a conditional offer of employment. All employers that conduct criminal background checks have to adhere to the legal limitations as outlined in the Fair Chance Act regulations. So let's cover those legal limitations. Let's say a background check reports criminal history on a California applicant. Then let's, let's walk through the steps. So step one, an employer has to conduct an individualized assessment. That hasn't changed, but the scope of that individualized assessment has been expanded. I'm gonna walk you through that on the next slide. So, so let's just put a pin on that individualized assessment. Let's say after that preliminary assessment, you believe that an applicant's criminal history poses an issue for your organization based on the roles and responsibilities of the job. Then step two, you have to notify the applicant in writing of your preliminary decision to possibly deny the applicant employment based on their criminal history. And as part of that notice, this pre-adverse action process, you have to provide several things. First, a copy of the criminal conviction history report identify the disqualifying conviction that's the basis for this preliminary decision, as well as information about the applicant's right to respond to the notice before the preliminary decision becomes final, and for an explanation of the types of evidence an applicant can submit to challenge the conviction history or evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation, along with five, the deadline for a response from the applicant. So there are a few nuances here. Employers can't require that an applicant provide a specific type of ed evidence demonstrating their rehabilitation. An applicant can voluntarily provide evidence of rehabilitation or mitigating circumstances, and employers can't refuse to accept any evidence provided by the applicant. Employers have to carefully evaluate any information provided by the applicant and give applicants a fair chance to demonstrate their qualifications and their readiness for their role. Employers also can't disqualify an applicant for failing to provide a specific type of evidence. Again, it's really up to the applicant to decide if they want to engage in a dialogue with you. Of course, it is to their benefit to do so, but the law specifically puts the ball in their court. So let's say that you've reviewed the applicant's criminal history and any evidence of rehabilitation that the applicant provided to you, and you still decide to move forward by adversely impacting the applicant's employment. Let's say their, their criminal history presents too much risk for your organization. Then step three, after waiting at least five business days, if you're using email or other electronic means to send that pre-adverse action notice, that first notice, then as part of the adverse action process, the California Fair Chance Regulation requires that an employer identify the candidate's right to file a complaint with the California Civil Rights Department 
challenging the employer's decision. So those are the fundamental changes to the pre-adverse and adverse action process. I want to go back though and talk about the individualized assessment. The California Fair Chance Act has always required that employers conduct an individualized assessment, but now the Civil Rights Department has included a non-exhaustive list of criteria that an employer must consider as part of the individualized assessment. And that's what you see on the screen. The three criteria that have existed as part of the individualized assessment process since the Fair Chance Act first passed in 2018, those have been expanded now to include the sub bullets on the screen, all of that other uh, all of those other items on the screen. And, and to that end, for high rate customers, we've recently drafted a new California specific criminal history questionnaire. This is what you would provide to candidates, an individualized assessment form. This is what you would complete to document your individualized assessment and pre adverse action letter samples for you to reference as you draft your documents to comply with California's law. I've also published an excerpt to the new California chapter that will be published to our Bound the Box white paper. All of those documents, the criminal history questionnaire, individualized assessment, pre-adverse action letter, the adverse action template, as well as this new California chapter, all of those documents can be found in Compliance, Work, uh, in Compliance Central and can be implemented by you in Compliance Workbench. As a reminder, you're going to need to manage your compliance obligation, these specific individualized assessment, pre-adverse and adverse action requirements, either within Compliance Workbench or outside of the high right platform. So please let us know in the survey if you have any questions or any interest in our free Compliance Workbench solution that can help you manage your compliance obligations with California's revised Fair Chance Act regulations. So here is our recap. As always, I try and bring you some actionable guidance as we navigate the compliance landscape. As a reminder, if you ask candidates to self-disclose their criminal history, you should periodically review your questions and any state or local instructions or notices that you provide to candidates to maintain compliance with clean slate or ban the box laws. It's your sole responsibility as employers to ensure that these notices and questions are compliant and relevant for your screening program. Just a general reminder to make sure that you're familiar with and have established processes to comply with the specialized notices and assessments that are required in band the box jurisdictions. Those are those other columns that we looked at in our matrix. Remember that California now requires an enhanced individualized assessment process and you can't use your standard pre adverse and adverse action letters for California candidates. You're going to have to ensure that they're tailored specifically to the amended band the box ordinances requirements again. If you're a higher right client, you can manage those processes in Compliance Workbench or outside of our platform if you prefer, but you cannot take a one size fits all approach to ban the box compliance. So as we close out this question, I wanna remind you to get your questions in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Okay, let's shift gears and talk about pay equity measures. Remember that pay equity measures look to promote equal pay for equal work and will often include a ban on asking a candidate about their former compensation until some later point in the hiring process. And pay transparency measures require that you share a pay range with candidates and in some cases with employees as well. Let's start with an overview of jurisdictions that prohibit employers from asking job candidates about their previous salaries. There are now more than two dozen municipalities or states that have enacted salary history bans. Again, the intent is to promote wage equity. And some studies have shown that salary history bans have closed the pay gap by around 2% between men and women. As a reminder, you can always ask a candidate about their salary expectations. Asking a candidate, what do you expect to make in this role is permissible 100% of the time. But in many jurisdictions, you can't ask about their former compensation. And we saw this trend kick off in New York City in 2018, and it's begun to cool a bit in favor of pay transparency laws, again, laws that do more with less. So the legislative intent behind pay transparency is that you can accelerate pay equity by simply paying folks based on an established pay scale. So here's a map I've created to show you the jurisdictions that require that you either post or provide a salary range for any open positions. The concept of pay transparency is exactly that. It requires that employers are open about how they intend to pay their employees. Most pay transparency laws note that the range you publish is what you 
reasonably expect to pay. So you'll need to conduct a pay analysis by role to determine the, man, the minimum and the maximum ranges for those roles, and then share the pay range with any job posts or advertisements. There are two, new, new, two new jurisdictions that require pay transparency, Hawaii in 2024 and Illinois in 2025. You'll see that Hawaii's measure only impacts employers with 50 or more employees and only applies to new hires. On the other hand, in Illinois, employers with 15 or more employees need to disclose the pay scale and a general description of benefits in job postings. There are also pay transparency requirements for internal positions in Illinois, and employers will have to announce any promotional opportunities to current employees no later than 14 calendar days after the employer advertises the job to prospective external employees. And let's cover New York's pay transparency law, which became effective on September 13th, I'm sorry, September 17th, 2023. The law requires employers with four or more employees to disclose the minimum and maximum annual salary or hourly wage in advertisements for jobs, promotions, and transfers, including electronic job postings. In addition to salary disclosure, you will also need to disclose the job description for the benefit for the position if one exists. That's a little different. So if you have a job description, you have to include it, but only if it exists. Take a look at geography. The pay transparency law applies to advertisements for jobs that will be physically performed in New York or will be physically performed outside of New York, but will report to a supervisor, an office, or other work site in New York. The law does not supersede or preempt local laws, rules, or regulations, so that means that you're going to need to comply with the existing pay transparency laws that are effective in Albany County, Ithaca, and New York City separately from New York State's law. The State Labor Department has proposed rules to clarify employers' pay transparency obligations. For example, they note as part of these rules that an employer is liable for a vendor's noncompliance. So let's say that you use a job board and that job board fails to post a salary range. You as an employer would be on the hook for that job board's noncompliance. So if you're an employer in New York, you should review the proposed rules and consider commenting on them by the November 12th deadline. And I want to quickly consider or quickly cover an interesting twist on pay equity and transparency laws coming to us from New Jersey. The state's Temporary Workers Bill of Rights became effective on August 5th and offers numerous protections to temporary workers assigned to an employer um, by a staffing agency or a third party. And as it relates to pay equity, workers placed by a temporary help service firm at a third party client must be paid the same average rate of pay as well as average cost of benefits as employees of third party clients performing the same or substantially similar work. So what does this all mean for employers in New Jersey? Well, if you use temporary workers supplied by a staffing agency, then you're going to need to identify your employees, these are your traditional employees, that are comparable for the purposes of setting the compensation of those temporary workers. And second, set the calculation of the temporary workers' compensation. So you have to identify comparable workers and then set the calculation of the temporary workers' compensation. And, and this is a little more tricky than it may seem on its face because the cost of benefits are in scope for the compensation that you need to pay the temporary worker. So while you don't need to directly provide the temporary worker with the benefits, you're going to have to add in the average cost of benefits to include things like health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, paid time off, uh, training, pension, all of those other benefits that you might include for your traditional worker that has to be included in the compensation calculation for your temporary workers. This is obviously a huge change for many employers. It's gonna be interesting to see what the impact of this legislation is on, on temporary workers. Curious to me if it'll cause more employers to maybe offshore jobs instead of going through this process for uh, complying with the temporary worker bill of rights. Very interesting. Quick side note. We're tracking a few bills in Massachusetts that would require pay transparency. In fact, since I created this slide, H4100 has been replaced by another bill, H4109, 
the end result is the same. It would require employers with 25 or more employees to disclose, disclose pay ranges. If this or any similar bills get any traction, higher right clients can expect to see an update with any developments. Um, I'll probably write something for, about this for our, our blog as well. But as we wrap our pay equity and transparency discussion, remember to assess your policies and procedures to comply with pay transparency laws and salary history bans. This means conducting a pay analysis and posting pay ranges in many cases, both internally and externally. And if you're still asking candidates to disclose their former compensation, you may need to rethink that practice. Many employers, for what it's worth, are adopting universal practices to no longer ask candidates about their salary history and are being transparent about their pay practices, regardless if a jurisdiction requires this. Again, see if this is something that you can comply with or something that you might want to roll out universally. It's of course your option to do so unless a jurisdiction specifically requires it. If you use the services of temporary workers in New Jersey, then you need to ensure that you're complying with the temporary workers bill of rights, including its pay equity requirements. And employers in Massachusetts should stay tuned as it's likely that the state will pass a, trade, a pay transparency law this legislative session. So that is our pay equity and transparency discussion. As always, use that Q&A icon to submit your questions. We'll get to those at the end of the webinar. And here is what I'm calling our potpourri category. I'm gonna cover general legislation and litigation updates that I think warrant your attention, but they don't necessarily fit in elsewhere. So potpourri, it's our new category. Starting with a new measure in Colorado, which impacts your application process. Colorado has passed a law that prohibits you from collecting any information related to age, date of birth, or dates of attendance at graduation from uh, an educational institution on initial employment applications. Again, this is only relevant to initial employment applications. This information, age, date of birth, dates of attendance, or graduation from educational institutions, all of that can be collected later in the hiring life cycle. For example, when you request a background check. As a reminder, California, Connecticut, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, they all also have these similar laws as, Cal as Colorado's, um, these laws that restrict age-related information in that initial employment application. But again, you can collect, collect it outside of that initial employment application as part of the background check process, for example. I wrote about Texas's Death Star Bill. It's a great name, isn't it? The Death Star Bill. I wrote about it in uh, Forbes, as well as the High Right blog. The, the Death Star Bill, also known as the Texas Regulatory Consistency Act, it limits local governments in Texas from passing ordinances that go beyond what's allowed under state law. And many municipalities, particularly those that have passed corporate tax incentives to woo employers or those that have tried to support workers' rights, such as passing down the box laws, they are not so happy. So practically speaking, the Death Star Bill would have preempted the ban the box ordinances in Austin and DeSoto, Texas. The bill was scheduled to go into effect on September 1st, but a Travis County District Court judge, Travis County is where Austin, Texas lies, uh, a Travis County District Court judge declared it to be unconstitutional under Texas law. Specifically, uh, the judge found it to be unconstitutionally vague. And while the state of Texas is appealing that decision, it's likely that the law cannot be enforced. So what should you do while we are in this period of uncertainty? Well, uh, what you may consider to do is uh, comply with the existing ban the box measures as drafted, as well as any local ordinances that are applicable to you. So again, comply with Austin's ban the box law, which as you might remember, has a modified adverse action process comply with the Soto's law, which requires an individualized assessment until we get clarity regarding the outcome of the Death Star Bill. And now my favorite part of the webinar, it's time for some audience participation. So I'm gonna walk you through a fact pattern and ask that you decide the case. Today, we're gonna to talk about what constitutes an adverse employment action. So. Listen up, here is our fact pattern. I've kind of outlined that for you on the screen. In 2019, a sheriff department in Texas moved from a seniority-based scheduling policy to a sex-based scheduling policy. 
And as part of the new policy, only male detention officers were given full weekends off from work. In comparison, the female detention officers were limited to either two weekdays off or one weekday and one weekend off. The Sheriff's Department defended this policy by noting that it would be unsafe for men to be off uh, during the week and instead safer for men to be off on weekends. However, her evidence showed male and female officers performed the same tasks and the number of inmates at the affected facilities were roughly identical during the week and on weekends. So what happens? Well, in 2020, nine female detention officers filed suit against the county in which the sheriff's department presided, asserting various discrimination claims. One claim specifically relied on Title VII's anti-discrimination provision. The female officers claimed that the county had engaged in the practice of discrimination with respect to the terms and conditions of their employment. So before I ask you to decide this case, I want to talk about the precedent that has been in place for the last 30 years or so. So the precedent is that in order for a plaintiff to demonstrate that they had been subject to discrimination under Title VII, it required the plaintiff to demonstrate that the adverse employment action resulted in, quote, an ultimate employment decision. Precedent, again, was that the adverse employment action had to result in an ultimate employment decision. So here we go. You be the judge. Here is our poll question. It's your opportunity to decide the case. Is the Sheriff's Department sex-based scheduling policy an adverse employment decision? I'm gonna give you a few more seconds to get your answers in. So let's take a look. The vast majority say, yes, it is an adverse employment action. Well, here is the outcome of the case. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with you. Uh, it took a little bit of work, um, and it required that they dis decide the case on bank, specifically this particular issue of ultimate employment decisions. So what they did is the, uh, the court listened to oral arguments on the issue of whether or not discriminatory actions needed to be the result of an ultimate employment decision. And they overturned the precedent that has been in place since 1995. The Court of Appeals began its analysis by acknowledging the plain language of Title VII is it's far broader than its former holdings allowed, than that 1995 holding allowed. Specifically, Title VII makes it, an, it makes it unlawful for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his or her compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The court acknowledged the final portion of the statutory phrase is broad. It's, it's not limited to this concept of economic or tangible discrimination, and it covers more than the terms or conditions in, in a contractual sense. So the Fifth Circuit was quoted as saying it had, quote, little, little difficulty determining that the female officers of the Sheriff's Department had plausibly alleged discrimination concerning the terms, the conditions, or privileges of their employment as the, quote, days and hours that one works are quintessential. So what does this all mean? Well, the takeaway for you as employers is that an adverse employment action could constitute something that isn't a final or ultimate employment decision. It doesn't have to be something as final as terminating someone but it could affect the terms and conditions of their employment, like scheduling. That could be an adverse action. So there you have it. New precedent out of the Fifth Circuit. So that wraps up our potpourri category. As we navigate compliance, remember that you should not ask job applicants for any information that relates to their age on an initial employment application if you're hiring in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Minnesota, or Pennsylvania. You can, of course, adopt a single policy that eliminates age-related inquiries across all hiring locations if you choose to do so. You will want to comply with ban-the-box ordinances in Austin and DeSoto, Texas, and a new case out of the Fifth Circuit 
for what it's worth, that has jurisdiction over parts of uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. That decision tells us that an action does not need to result in an ultimate employment decision. It can affect the terms and conditions of employment for it to be considered discriminatory. Scheduling, for example, is enough. So let's move on to a recap of issues concerning privacy and technology impacting employers that progressed this quarter. Here is our overview of state privacy legislation. Our chart is getting big. Um, I would actually appreciate some guidance as I'm trying to move beyond this chart. Let me know if you think maybe a map would be helpful here or if there is another way to displace this information. But here is a quick recap of privacy laws in the United States. Oregon, Texas, and Delaware are new to our list of measures that have been signed into law. And just a reminder, in California, enforcement of the rules related to the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, that were introduced in March 2023, they are not going to be enforced until next year. Also, some action in Connecticut. Connecticut has some new rules concerning online privacy and the protection of minors' data. Those rules will become effective in 2024. The important takeaways are that each of these laws basically requires that individuals are notified concerning the collection, use, and retention of their data, and given some control over their data. Here is the good news. Each law contains an exception for activities conducted in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FCRA. This is the regulation that uh, regulates how employers request background checks and how consumer reporting agencies like HireRight provide those background checks to you. So, each of these laws contains an exception for activities conducted in compliance with the FCRA, which means that background checks are out of scope. So again, any data collected for the purpose of processing the background check request outside of the scope of each of the privacy laws you see on the screen. It's outside of the scope of each of the privacy laws. But I do want to move on um, and talk about New York City. The City's artificial intelligence and hiring ordinance impacts employers who use automated employment decision tools. Automated employment decision tools are tools that substantially help with making employment decisions or replace employment decisions made by humans altogether. This ordinance became effective on July 5th. So what does it do? Well, New York City's law prohibits employers from using automated employment decision tools or AEDTs to screen candidates or employees unless a bias audit has been conducted before deploying the AEDT. So if you use any tools, for example, that filter out resumes to determine uh, who gets through your candidate selection process or perhaps um, who might get an offer for a job, then those are all in scope of New York City's law. The law requires that employers using AEDTs undergo an annual bias audit on the AEDT conducted by an independent auditor and publish that information to their website. There is also a notice requirement. Employers have to provide notice to the candidate 10 days prior to the use of an automated employment decision tool. Um, so practically speaking, how would you accomplish this? You'd probably publish it on your talent website or your company's general website. Um, so there are a lot of nuances concerning New York City's AEDT law. What I've done is I've included the city's full overview of the rules associated with this law in the resources section of this webinar. So check that out. It is most certainly worth a read if you use any AI solution, AEDTs, for example, in New York City. Now let's talk about what's going on at the national level. The EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has issued guidance concerning the use of artificial intelligence and employment decisions and disparate impact. So what is disparate impact? Well, disparate impact occurs when an employer uses a process to make employment selections, like let's say choosing candidate for hire over another or uses a test for a candidate selection process that on its face appears neutral, but actually adversely or negatively affects a disproportionate number of individuals based on a protected characteristic, something like their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And what guidance does the EEOC have for us? Well, I've summarized that in the four bullets at the bottom of the screen. First, they put us on notice that AI or other tools that make or substantially facilitate employment decisions about whether to hire, promote, or terminate an individual 
those solutions should be audited to ensure that they are not discriminatory. Second, employers who use third-party solutions to help make employment decisions are not shielded from liability if those third-party solutions end up disproportionately affecting someone in a protected class, like members of a particular race or sex, for example. So em employers, you're on hook, again, for your vendor's compliance or non-compliance, as it may be. Third, and, and this is an interesting one, the four-fifths rule applies. So what is this? Well, four-fifths is 80%, right? And 80% can be a general benchmark, the EEOC believes, for assessing disparate impact. So let's break this down. Let's say you use an AI tool as part of your candidate selection process, and you're looking at two groups of candidates, let's say men and women. Based on the four-fifths rule, there should not be more than a 20% variance on who gets selected from those two groups. So, for example, if your AI tool selects 100% of men all of the time, but only 70% of women who apply, then there's more than a 20% variance between that group, right? Those two groups. That selection procedure is potentially discriminatory because the variance between men and women is 30%, right? So this means that there could be evidence of a discriminatory hiring practice in play, which you'd want to assess. Now, the EEOC notes that this four-fifths rule, this 20% variance, is only a rule of thumb. It is not a hard and fast rule that discrimination is occurring, but it is something that you may use, a test that you may use to determine if you have discriminatory hiring practices in place. And finally, if you discover that your AI solution results in a disparate impact, then you're going to need to stop using that solution or retool it so it doesn't continue to result in disparate impact. And that's the EEAC's guidance in a nutshell. It is definitely worth a read. I have also linked to it in the resources section of this webinar. So again, there's a lot of information here regarding technology and privacy. Get your questions in using the Q&A icon if you have any questions. And as we recap, uh, to navigate the compliance roadmap, FCRI regulated background check data is exempt from the scope of state data privacy laws. So you don't need to concern yourself with example, a data protection agreement with your background check vendor for that data. However, if you operate in California, you will need to assess your ability to comply with that state's privacy law as it relates to your other employee data. For example, the personally identifiable data that you collect as part of the application or interview processes. Additionally, you're going to want to ensure that you are transparent concerning your use of artificial intelligence. For example, when using artificial intelligence solutions that automatically filter out resumes. And if you operate in New York City, assess your use of automated employment decision tools to comply with the city's law, which again is enforced as of July 5th. And know that the EEOC has AI enforcement on the horizon. They are most certainly interested in this. In fact, they just settled their very first EEOC or their very first AI related claim with a, a Chinese language company. Um, so a lot going on in that space. Like I mentioned earlier, please get your questions in using those chat Q and A icon, and we'll get to those questions at the end of this webinar. Let's pivot and talk about cannabis reform, a crowd favorite. You're going to hear me use the terms cannabis and marijuana and THC. All of those terms, cannabis, marijuana, THC, interchangeably in this section. They are the same thing for the purposes of this webinar, so please do not let that confuse you. Starting with our medical cannabis snap, I revised the categories that you see at the bottom of the screen last quarter to hopefully make this easier to read. Let me know what you think. Looking at your screen, you'll see the states in red where accommodation is likely not required. States in aqua where anti-discrimination measures are in place and where reasonable accommodation of medical marijuana is required. And states in blue where the law is silent on the issue of accommodation. And then Philadelphia shown in that purple wine color, which has banned pre-employment marijuana testing. Again, Philadelphia banned pre-employment marijuana testing several years ago. Make sure you're not testing for marijuana on a pre-employment basis in Philadelphia. The remaining states in gray have not passed a medical cannabis law. When I talk about cannabis or marijuana accommodation, I mean that in certain states, you cannot discriminate against an individual just because they are a lawful cannabis user. And of course, the need to accommodate not only differs by state, but also by role. 
For example, there are typically, but not always, exceptions to accommodation for individuals in certain safety-sensitive positions. But 100% of the time, there are always exceptions for those in DOT-regulated positions. Moving on, here is our recreational map, which I've also revised for clarity. Again, let me know what you think. As you can see on the screen, 23 states and DC have legalized recreational cannabis, also known as adult use legalization. While locations in red have no impact on employers, those jurisdictions shown in aqua, blue, or purple line are different. Those jurisdictions shown in aqua allow for pre-employment testing for cannabis, but the statutes say that an employer cannot impact employment due to a positive test for THC. And next year in California and Washington, shown in blue, you will not be able to conduct pre-employment tests for, quote, non-psychoactive THC metabolites one more time. Next year in California and Washington, in blue on the screen, you will not be able to conduct pre-employment tests for non-psychoactive THC metabolites. This means that you're gonna either need to stop testing for THC or move to a solution like oral fluid by January 1st. And in New York State and Minnesota, pre-employment testing for cannabis is prohibited unless an exception applies. So please make sure that you align your drug testing panels accordingly. Again, this isn't something that's automatically done for you. It requires your direction since some of your positions may be exempt from the, from the prohibition on testing. Let us know if you need help with this when you complete the survey at the end of the webinar. And just one update in the third quarter, and that's Washington, D.C.'s Cannabis Employment Protection Act, which became effective on July 13th. We've talked about this over the course of the last few years, but but it's worth bringing up again. Um, and I'm going to start with, I think, another civics lesson for you. The legislative process in D.C. is unique. Go figure, right? It's unique in that it requires Congress to oversee lawmaking. And Congress has not funded the DC Office of Human Rights to enforce this Cannabis Act. So while the act prohibits employers from taking adverse personal actions against an individual for cannabis or marijuana use off premises during non-work hours, there's no budget to enforce the act. The act also requires that employers provide a specific notice to workers, and that notice is to be provided by the DC Office of Human Rights. But again, they're not funded. So while the bill doesn't specifically outlaw testing for marijuana, an employer cannot adversely impact the employment of someone who has THC in their system absent other articulable symptoms of employment. So that is DC's very interesting law. There are, of course, numerous exceptions to the act as outlined on the screen. Stay tuned to see when they get funded, likely next year as part of the congressional cycle, and we'll of course provide you updates with respect to enforcement and that notice that the DC office is to produce, which will be made available on their website once actually published. So here is our actionable guidance summary as we navigate compliance. I'll lead by saying that it is impractical to maintain zero tolerance drug test policies. Instead, employers should focus on cannabis use and impairment at work and ensure that policies are amended to reflect that position. It's also really important to adjust your policies and practices so that if a drug test is positive for marijuana, you need to understand whether that individual is a medical user or a recreational user. In some cases, you might have to accommodate the medical use of marijuana, but not the recreational use. And in some jurisdictions like Washington, D.C., you have to accommodate all marijuana use, period. Finally, remember to revise your drug testing panels to exclude marijuana where required for most jobs. While you don't need to do that in D.C., you might elect to do so. And by 2024, so sometime in this quarter, in, Wa in California and Washington State, you need to exclude testing for non-psychoactive marijuana metabolites. Hi, right, customers, your account managers wanted me to remind you of this. You basically have two options to discuss with your legal counsel and internal stakeholders in California and Washington State. By January 1st, 2024, you need to decide whether you're going to stop testing for marijuana 
or use an alternative testing procedure, something like oral fluid, blood, or breath that tests for those psychoactive marijuana metabolites that indicate impairment. You need to use those in combination with other factors to assess impairment. So you can't rely on urine or hair tests for pre-employment random or reasonable suspicion testing. 100% of the cases, random, reasonable suspicion, or should you choose to continue pre-employment testing for marijuana in California and Washington, by the start of the year, you're gonna have to adopt oral fluid, blood or breath, or stop testing altogether. I've said it before, worth reiterating, changing your drug testing program is not something that your screening provider is going to do for you because they don't know if the candidate that you're considering may work in a position where marijuana testing or affecting the employment of someone who tests positive is permitted. Again, this is your responsibility. So please let us know if you need help adjusting your drug testing panels when you complete the survey at the end of today's webinar. And a reminder, any jurisdiction that has passed a law legalizing marijuana, either for medical or recreational use, always exempts DOT regulated positions, positions serving a federal contract or subject to federal funding. And in many cases, but not all cases, safety sensitive positions as defined by that jurisdiction's statute. So that is everything I have on cannabis, a lot of information here. And it is one of our most mis misunderstood areas with, with pretty significant compliance implications. So please get your questions in using that Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen if you need any clarification. And now let's quickly cover three important updates to the I-9 and E-Verify process. First, you may have heard of this. There is a new version of Form I-9 that's been published by DHS, Department of Homeland Security. I've linked to the form in the resources section of this webinar. There are several changes to the form which are outlined on the screen. All employers must use the new version of Form I-9 by November 1st, 2023, so just in a couple of weeks. I wanna focus on that last bullet in red. This is, I think, the biggest deal to come out of this form revision. The new form has a checkbox that permits E-Verify customers to indicate that they have remotely virtually inspected a worker's I-9 documents. So let's, let's break that down. How does that work? Well, here is the workflow provided by USCIS on the screen. I've linked to that as well for what it's worth in the resources section of this webinar. If you're not enrolled in E-Verify, then you have to use the standard in-person process to review a person's I-9 documents. So that might encourage you to actually enroll in E-Verify, right? But as of August 1st, 2023, if you've enrolled in E-Verify and you're in good standing, you can now use a virtual remote process to complete Form I-9. Here's, here's the workflow. You're gonna first ask your new employee to review the list of I-9 acceptable documents and send you either a list A document or a list B and C document. They'll need to send you a clear and legible copy of both the front and back of those documents, front and back if it has a back, right? They'll need to schedule a video call with them. So a you know Teams call, Zoom call, whatever it may be, even a FaceTime, um, and walk them through the three steps that I've identified on the right side of the screen. So basically they'll show you the same documents that they previously sent to you and you'll see if they reasonably appear genuine and match that new, that new hire. Then you're gonna take a look at that third box on the left side of the screen. You'll mark the checkbox in the additional information uh, field of section two to show that the employer used the remote document verification procedure. If you're still using the 2019 version of Form I-9, then you're gonna, re you're gonna write alternative procedure in the additional information field. Then, then step four, you're gonna keep clear and legible copies of the employee's documents with the completed Form I-9. Remember that you're gonna to have to produce the Form I-9 and copies of their documents to USCIS if there is an I-9 inspection or enforcement action. Hopefully that won't happen, but you wanna have the documents in case there is an inspection or action. And finally, you're required to open an E-Verify case inquiry by the end of the third business day after hire. Quick note, employers should not open E-Verify cases when free verifying Form I-9. That, that's it. That is the new remote verification process for Form I-9 in combination with E-Verify. Take a look at the workflow that I linked to. Again, it's the workflow that you see on the screen um, so that you can familiarize yourself with the process. I think many employers um, who use E-Verify will likely use this remote virtual process. I'm going to wrap with a quick reminder. 
all I-9s that were virtually inspected during the COVID-19 pandemic need to be re-verified. They should have been re-verified by August 30th. So you should have either re-verified the I-9 documents presented to you during the pandemic, either physically, in person, or by virtual or remote means if you originally created any verified case for that new hire. So again, make sure that you re-verified all of those documents by August 30th that you accepted using the COVID-19 remote verification process. So here is our recap. You need to transition to the new form I-9 by November 1st, 2023. High rate customers who use our I-9 solution should have received or will receive information about the transition to new form I-9 on our platform. We're taking a phased approach to rollout. Remember to make sure you familiarize yourself and your teams with the new form I-9 so as to minimize the likelihood of errors in the I-9 process. Um, you'll probably wanna make sure you've had several training sessions with your teams who complete I-9s um, as you don't want to, to create uh, errors in the I-9 process. Um, E-Verify employers, you can use the virtual remote verification process and new form I-9 has a checkbox that lets you indicate that you're using that virtual remote verification process. Uh, you should have re-verified any list A, B, or C documents that you received using the virtual remote means during the pandemic by August 30th. Uh, just a few reminders, Highright offers an I-9 solution with a digital audit trail. We support E-Verify and we offer remote in-person I-9 services. So please let us know if we can help you with any of your I-9 or E-Verify needs. Uh, just let us know as you complete the survey in this webinar if you need help with I-9 or E-Verify. A lot going on in this area. So uh, again, please, please just uh, ask those questions. And we've linked to several resources in this webinar. So you may want to just bookmark those or copy and paste them into an email for your future reference. Quick plug as you get your questions in for our Q&A session, we have several outlets of information for you to consume. So if something piqued your interest, check out the resource library blog or Forbes articles to learn more. So now I have time just for a question or two and all the questions received today will be consolidated and turned into a post that you can find on the Higher Right blog in a few weeks. If I don't get to your question today and it's pressing, please let me know when you complete the survey and I'll get back to you more quickly. So in our last few minutes, uh, let's see what we have in the hopper. Wow, an incredible amount of audience engagement. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, in fact, in fact, well over well over 100 questions in, in the hopper today. So um, a lot of questions generally concerning the California Fair Chance Act regulations, the revised process, and that's completely understandable. Uh, a few, I think, takeaways for you. One, if you're a high right customer, know that we published a lot of information about this as well as sent out customer communications. So look for those. If you haven't received them, let us know and we'll send those to you. But one, there is an enhanced individualized assessment process. Second, I think the second substantive takeaway is that the pre-adverse action process has been modified. So as part of the pre-adverse action process, um, you still have to provide a copy of the background report. You still have to identify the disqualifying conviction that is the basis for your decision. Um, but here's what's different. You have to include information about the applicant's right to respond to the notice before you move forward to an adverse action process should you dis decide to do so. So that is different. The applicant's right to respond is different. And what is also different um, is the description of the types of evidence that an applicant can provide to you voluntarily to challenge your conviction history um, decision as, as well as any evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation. Uh, so that is different along with the deadline for a response from the applicant. That is different as well. So those three items are different as part of the pre-adverse action process. Again, if you're a higher right customer, we have a sample template created that you can reference as you create your own documents within Compliance Workbench or outside of our, our, um, our platform. Uh, the timing that you have to wait between the pre-adverse and adverse action process is also different. 
Uh, there are various times depending on whether you physically mail something or use electronic means. If you use electronic means, the statute specifically identifies, I should say the regulation specifically identifies email, then it's at least five business days between that pre-averse and adverse action process. And most importantly, the entire individualized assessment dialogue, this is the dialogue where the applicant decides whether or not to provide you with evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation. That's all in the applicant's court. Um, they are not required to provide you with any of that information. It is all voluntary. Okay. In our last minute, several questions concerning uh, the California and Washington uh, drug testing process. Again, you have to remove uh, THC, the testing for the psychoactive, the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, non-psychoactive THC properties by the start of the year. This means that if you continue to test for THC in California or Washington, you need to move forward with either adopting an oral fluid, blood, or breath sample. Um, you can, of course, choose not to test for THC as well if you find that to be valuable for your screening program. So with that, we are um, out of time. Uh, you can expect this webinar to be posted to the Higher Right Resource Library shortly, and you'll also receive an email with your SHRM and HRCI credit information in a few days. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Please take 60 seconds to complete the webinar survey. I take your feedback seriously, so please let me know how I'm doing. I consider it to be my report card. With that, we'll chat again in January, where we'll, I'll host my annual compliance year in review. Until then, thanks again for spending a portion of your day with me today, and we will meet again in the new year. Thanks, everyone.